The age of self-driving or autonomous vehicles is fast approaching. Oh, yeah. How will this technology impact our lives? From the KLJ Cybersecurity Division, Mr. Dave Blair is in studio, and Miss Metaverse Katie Aquinia will be joining uh, a little bit later to give us their take on this emerging technology. At the control panel, Mr. Producer Extraordinaire, Jim Walsh. Hello. How's it going? Not too bad. Enjoy the thunderstorms yesterday? Well, I love a rainy night. Yeah. Thank you, Eddie Rabbit, wherever you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand uh, upstate we did have an oil fire that they think was caused by the lightning. Yeah, that's uh, pretty amazing, A couple of families actually. had to, a couple of families in the area had to bug out. It was up around Newtown, that area. You know, it always amazes me when we have an electrical storm when it's cool like this. Cause yeah. Because I don't think the temperature got above 45 yesterday, did it? Well, I don't think so, no. So it was It's only pretty... getting up to about 45 today. Right. Or it's supposed to. Right. And... You know, when I was a kid, I never heard of thunder and lightning during a winter storm. Is this a new thing, a global warming related or whatever? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Thunder I mean, blizzard is a term I'd never heard in my life until really? about five years ago. Yeah, it, it has happened. Yeah. Uh, not that, I don't know why we're talking about thunder blizzard now, because I don't think blizzard. we're, although I, there is some snow falling to the north of us. Yeah, there is. So they might actually hear a little thunder and see a little lightning during the snow up there. Well, so. theoretically, we can get a little bit the snow at least just about any time of year yes now. yeah i believe the only month we haven't had snow in north dakota is august that's what i heard too so i've i actually remember july 4th one time where we had some snow <laughs> so i know well, I it was know. just a couple of years ago remember the first weekend of may yeah two years ago actually it was the first weekend of june because i remember flying in that morning and there was snow on the ground whoa yeah so it does happen occasionally Not a big fan so, of that. yeah for Not sure a fan of that. for sure but at the other mic of course from the Cybersecurity Division at KLJ. A new post for him, actually, but he's been with KLJ a long time. Mr. Dave Blair, how you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing very well, thank you. I was just hearing you guys talk, and uh, I was thinking that maybe uh, it had something to do with uh, Prince passing away in the Purple Rain <laughs> coming <laughs> down on <laughs> us. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So were you a, or are you a Prince fan? No, I, okay. I, I am not, but I know he's just an awesome, talented individual, and there's sure. a lot of good stories that are coming out that how sure. what kind of person he was. It is interesting, though. Um, I actually have this on my notes today, too. I don't know how I feel about this, but they're actually going to put Purple Rain back in the theaters. So to me, it's kind of a commercialization of his untimely death, you know, and I would imagine, you know, Michael Jackson, of course, probably had the, you know, the, his estate had to deal with this stuff and things too, but, um, I think they could wait a month or two anyway. Yeah. I'm just saying. It was on so. TV on Saturday. Oh yeah. Yeah. But they're, they're actually re-releasing it in a very quick, oh. uh, hurry here to put it back in the theaters, you know? So, and you know, I, I, am one of those people that would actually go to the theater to, to, I, I prefer the theater over watching it on my own TV, even though we have these huge things nowadays, but, right. um, it's still an experience to go there, of course. But anyway, um, yeah, so you were just, at, in Toronto. At the self or autonomous uh, car summit, uh, self-driving or autonomous car vehicle summit, I should say, yep. in uh, Toronto. And you and I, even though we talk a lot about this, have not actually discussed your trip yet. So I need to know, of course, my inquiring mind, um, some of the cool stuff that you saw there. Well, you know, there was there wasn't any vehicles there okay. at all. So um, it was just more of people talking um, in regards to what to expect. Um, and you know, it's really interesting. Canada is really on top of a lot of stuff that's going on, in, and sometimes even know more what's going on in the United States sure. than, than we do. So it was a it was a great conference with a lot of people that uh, shared what they thought was going to uh, see happening. And a lot of it might have been even more around the urban settings versus rural, although there was some talk about, hey, we can't forget about rural too and what's going to happen there. But it was a lot of planning too about how do we change our infrastructure for these autonomous vehicles? What's going to happen for parking and everything like that? Interesting. So what was your probably the biggest takeaway from the conference? For you, well, I I think the the biggest takeaway was that there's there's just so much happening um, 
across the world, especially uh, over in Switzerland, there was a guy that came and spoke on his new company called uh, 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 Rideco, and he, it was it was kind of interesting because he's got um, already manufactured a whole bunch of these small mini buses that take people around. If you want to go on a tour, okay. you can do that. Um, or if, you know, shuttling them from one location to another, um, really, so, really economically. So you're sorry. talking like airport to a hotel type of scenario or, or whatever. E- exactly. Or theme parks, sure. you know, taking them around, you know, instead of having a rail, you use the vehicle. So it was, it was pretty cool. So how many people does this thing hold? Well, you know, they got different. They got different um, um, uh, components of it. Uh, one of them, some of them are six, some of them are eight, some of them are up to twelve. Okay. And uh, are they a closed cabin or yeah, open? They, okay. Yep. Okay. And and they're really easy to get on and off. I mean, they're almost like at street level, so you don't have, even have like a normal bus. I see. You have to step up. Yep. To get into them, and uh, that was pretty cool. And and I misspoke. That the name of the name of that company was called Best Mile. And uh, the other thing that's really neat about this application is that they'll program for you're going to go from one location to another, and um, they will take the best and fastest route to get there. So you just program I it see. in. So. So are you thinking that as we start moving towards the autonomous age, that we're going to see adaptation in maybe the public transportation sector before we start seeing that type of technology in our vehicles? You know, I I think that like with uh, everything that's going on in the autonomous vehicle world, it seems like uh, Europe is always kind of a little one step ahead of us testing all of that, which is good. Because then it allows us to maybe bring some of that back and look well, think, at it. I think some of the com- countries over there have fewer regulations that they have to hurdle past, uh, which allows them some more flexibility to test, I think, is what it is. Exactly. And so that I thought that was really interesting. And I, I still think that I can see that in a rural setting, too. Um, as many buses as we have uh, moving children around from school to school, um, you know, I don't think that's going to happen, you know, anytime in the very near future, but I think it will. And uh, maybe having smaller fleets, not these big buses that right. that run on diesel. Um, these are running electric. Okay. <laughs> so Interesting. Interesting. So I'd imagine they probably nest somewhere and get and charge back up, very similar to my vacuum cleaners that I have running around our house right now. So yep, actually they have a bus port that okay. they have and they charge them all up and it's pretty cool. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. So I was uh, just kind of playing around this morning and ran across this survey online that talked about you know the amount of people that would not get an autonomous vehicle. And then there's the other spectrum of how many people would love to do this so they could nap while they're while it's driving down the road. So we're going to get into some of those numbers as well as maybe some other takes that that uh, Mr. Dave Blair found out there in Toronto. So come on back, everybody. Right now, thirty-seven. The Red River Farm Network. Ag News is here on Super Talk 1270. Follow the Guru of Geek at Facebook.com backslash the Tech Ranch or Twitter at Guru of Geek or the Tech Ranch.com. Here again is your Guru of Geek, Marlo Anderson. And we do want to thank all of our listeners across the country and around the world who follow us on the Blueberry Network. We're also on the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. We are on iTunes. We're on Roku. We are on tuned in we're also broadcasting live today on meerkat so if you want to join us on meerkat you can do that as well if you hop on over to the techranch.com uh, you can actually see the meerkat feed and you'll see all of our lovely faces in the studio here jim's smiling as i say that <laughs> so is dave uh we're talking about autonomous vehicles today and we're going to get into some of these stats in a little bit here dave but uh, we were just talking over the break here about uh, a conversation I had actually with my brother-in-law yesterday. Uh, he's he actually talked to my wife here not too long ago about that he was kind of against this autonomous vehicle thing, and and I get that. I have a lot of fears 
with this myself. So it's fun to actually listen to how other people feel about it. Because sometimes, because I'm, I'm such an advocate of this that maybe I put my, you know, I just don't listen to people like I probably should about it. Uh, but his, probably his biggest concern, and in fact, we actually negated each other on everything else that he had to say, but his number one concern is the ability to hack these vehicles. You know, the ability for somebody to take over a large fleet of vehicles, maybe even turn vehicles on each other to crash into each other simply by somebody sitting at a computer someplace else and taking it over. So since you're part of cybersecurity now, can you maybe alleviate some of these things or is is there something that can be done that maybe we're not thinking about yet that can secure vehicles? Well, I, I know for a fact that uh, there's, there, I always use this comment, there's a lot of smart bad people out there that are trying to disrupt um, any type of uh, systems out there, whether it's electrical systems, water systems. I mean, but, you know, in regards to the autonomous vehicle side of things, when your computer now is going to be controlling a lot of it, there's got to be some safeguards that need to be taken into account. And I think that, uh, you know, as, as we continue to look at um, you know, who's in control of these vehicles? Is there a, 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 a secure um, a location there where they're not being um, hacked into that you can have it being monitored, you know, 24 um, 7? You know, we're doing that right now with pipelines within our company and making sure that there's no, you know, leaks, detection of that kind of um, disruptive. And I know that last year one of our guys went to this um, uh, summit um, black hat in Vegas, yep. and the, one of the guys um, that was presenting said, hey, do you see that Corvette over there? Watch this. And got on his phone, had obviously gotten the, uh, the, the information from the uh, car and was able to unlock the car and, you know, right. and start it up. Right. So, yeah, there's concerns definitely on there, but I think we – you know, we have to start preparing for what those concerns could be and how do we build safeguards into so the I, systems. Yep. I think one of the things that and I'm starting to see more and more of like two-tiered protection systems, you know, that maybe in order for you to log into account, an account, it has to text you a password type of thing. So there's like this secondary level of, of uh, protection. I see that with cars too, and as I, as my brother-in-law was talking about this yesterday, uh, I was thinking about what a person could do maybe on their side to protect this scenario from happening. And to me, it's as simple as a key. I mean, we're already used to using keys for the most part. I know that we're moving more away from keys lately uh, with our vehicles, but uh, to me, if there was just a simple device that you would just plug into your car that then could start, you know, then you can start it and you can do all this other stuff with it. Uh, and that has to be in place before everything else takes effect. And I'm just kind of throwing out ideas here. Mm -hmm. If something were to happen while you're driving the vehicle where somebody were to take it over or whatever, it's a simple thing of taking the key back out, yep. you know, so you could actually disrupt what's going on uh with the vehicle if you wanted to I, i'm just throwing scenarios out there but i think that there are some simplistic type of things that could be done uh as opposed to overthinking about how do we how do we protect ourselves you know electronically maybe there's just something that you and i can do to the car personally uh that will stop that type of scenario from happening i don't know i'm just kind of throwing that it, out there but it's going to take a lot smarter person than me to figure well and me and, 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 and me too but i i think sometimes that a lot of this stuff it's, it's just like um you know people complain and we get we get people coming in all the time that their computers are hacked into or whatever and most of the stuff happens when they're not on their computer so to me there's there's two simple solutions to this you either turn off the internet to the via or to the to the computer or you just turn the computer off Yep. You know, there's no way that anybody can get into your computer if you sever the com line of communication, either by turning it off or, or that. So I'm just throwing that mm -hmm. out there as just a, a common sense approach to some of this stuff, you know. So um, anyway, so some of the numbers. So I have to read a little bit here now, but let's see here. So 30% of those surveyed 
said they are they would be scared about uh, losing the enjoyment of driving. So, are you one that likes to drive? I love driving. I, Jim, I love how about control. you? Mm, sometimes. Okay, so are you are you one of those that um, if you're out for a leisurely drive, you'd like to still be able to do yeah. that? Oh yeah. But it's okay if you were working or whatever to not have to drive the car. Yeah, if I'm going to and from work, sometimes if I'm really tired, it would be nice not to have to deal with that, okay. the driving part. Okay, okay, good, good. Dave, you're kind of the same way too? or? Uh, yeah, I think I said one thing, though. I, I, I like to have control, so that's going to be okay. one of the issues that I might have is relinquishing that control. But, you know, when I, I drive a lot and long distances, man, I do get tired and you know, pull over, or take a nap if I need to, but this way I wouldn't have to. So, yeah, there's going to be some uh, learning curve for a lot of people to relinquish that. And I know, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking to your character now, I guess, but you are because I think every time I've ever gone somewhere with you, you always volunteer to drive. Every time. Yep. So you do that for everybody, <laughs> don't you? Pretty much. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, that's okay. That's okay. I just wanted to kind of get into that a little bit. Okay, so... 45% of respondents to this survey said they would uh, feel very uncomfortable with an autonomous car being fully in control. When it came to being behind the wheel of a self-driving car, 51% of people said they would feel unsafe or very unsafe. So basically half the population or half the people that were surveyed here said that they would, be, they would not feel safe being in an autonomous vehicle. A third of respondents, 34%, said they feared that an autonomous vehicle would not be able to avoid an accident. So, but, you know, most people don't know. It's like anything else. They just don't know enough about this technology yet because it's not out there. So, and this is also an interesting stat. There is one fatality for approximately 100 million miles driven in this country. So one fatality for every 100 million miles driven in this country. So it's going to take a long time before we even have any statistical information about how safe autonomous vehicles are because the entire Google fleet has put on 1.3 million miles right now. I mean, it just it just takes a long time to, to clock up that many miles and have statistics on how safe this technology can potentially be. But I don't know about you. I, I'm going to guess uh, where you're at. But where do you feel autonomous vehicles will be when it comes to the safety factor? Are they going to be safer or not as safe? Oh, I I think they're going to be uh, a lot safer. So, what are your reasons for that? I mean, what what with what you've seen so far, why do you think autonomous vehicles will be dramatically safer? Well, I think that in order to introduce something new into the public, um, there's got to be a lot of research and development goes into it. It's not like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna throw this vehicle on there and see what happens. And I think any new, new technology, I, it would be interesting to find out how much research and development time hours have been put into it before it even becomes something the public would be, you know, involved with. Sure. So, you know, I, I think that there's, there's so much um, things that can, be, that can be done. And the, the computer, as we know, is just getting better and smarter all the time. So that's going to be a, an area where I think you're going to see that happening. And then the quality of the vehicles, too. I mean, they're getting stronger and, you know, for trying to avoid if there is an accident that, you know, they're not somebody inside's not physically hurt. I mean... Look at airbags that never were right. around, you know, 30 years ago. So, And I think most people would be, probably when airbags came out, most people weren't excited about them, were unsure about the safety uh, benefits of having that device in your vehicle. Probably weren't excited about the cost of adding it, too, because I think an airbag adds like $600 to the price of a car or something like that. I think it's come down a lot now, but yeah. at the time it was pretty expensive. Uh, but now I don't think there's anybody out there or very few people that would disagree that they have not added a – have dramatically impacted the safety of a vehicle. Now, there are exceptions to the rule, just like seatbelts. There are exceptions to the rule. I mean, you, um, you, know, you might save 100 lives and lose one because of the technology. So uh, that does happen. But after the break, everybody, we will continue this conversation on autonomous vehicles 
And Miss Metaverse Katie Aquino will be joining us as well. Right now, 37. Dave Ramsey is heard here. Super Talk 1270. We're back to the Tech Ranch. Stream this program now at supertalk1270.com. Here is your guru of geek, Marlo Anderson. And in studio we have Mr. Jim Walsh, the producer extraordinaire, Mr. Dave Blair with Cyber Security Division over at KLJ. And joining us on the phone, Miss Metaverse Katie Aquino. Katie, welcome to the Tech Ranch. Thank you. How are you doing? Doing fine. How about you? <laughs> I hope you're doing okay as well over in the New York area. So, Long pause there. Yes, yeah. She paused for quite a while. So, yeah. And, of course, I'm, I'm thinking you probably remember Mr. Dave Blair, don't you? Oh, yes. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Nice to hear your so. voice again. All right, so back. we'll get right into it here. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, the security of them. We were just going over some stats, and I'll read these to you as well, Katie, so maybe you have some comment on them. Uh, 30%, this is in a recent poll by a company called What Car? And 45% of the respondents said they would feel uncomfortable uh, in an autonomous vehicle being in fully control when it came to being behind the wheel of self-driving car 51 percent said they would feel safe or unsafe or very unsafe so basically 50 percent of the people are not excited about being in an autonomous vehicle a third of respondents 34 percent said they feared that an autonomous car would not be able to avoid an accident also 30 percent of the surveyed said they were scared about losing the enjoyment of driving but just as many however despite all these concerns 26 percent said they would feel comfortable enough in an autonomous car to take a nap. So these are the statistics that we're dealing with right now. So you have 50% of the people that are feeling unsafe about being in an autonomous vehicle, but you have 26% that would actually take a nap right now. So that that's quite uh, a... <laughs> Quite a, quite a um, and I, I don't know if that 26% are also like the first adapters to other technologies as well. I'm guessing that they probably are, and that's why they're willing to take that leap. So anyway, right. so those are the stats. What do you have for us today? Well, you know, I actually, I, I believe that that's pretty accurate. Like you said, you know, people haven't been in an autonomous car before. So if you haven't been in an autonomous car before, how are you supposed to feel comfortable in it? I think there has to be some kind of skepticism or that that fear of something you haven't done. And I will say the first time I was in one, probably two and a half years ago, I, I don't know if I was visibly shaking, but I was nervous. I was very nervous, actually. Um, right. And I, I, so I, I get the fear part of it. But I will also say that two years later, um, I had the opportunity to, to ride in the Peterbilt autonomous truck a couple months ago. And it was at the end of the truck or at the end of the ride where the developer that I was sitting there talking to said, do you want to talk about the autonomous vehicle or not, or not? You know, we were just like, we were so engaged in other conversation that the whole purpose of us being in this vehicle was to test the vehicle out. But we were both so comfortable in the vehicle that we didn't even think anything of it. So it's like getting used to a new driver. And once you get past that and you trust the technology, then you start doing other things and, 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 you know, talking to your, to the person that's with you or, or doing some other work. So, I found that interesting that we got through that entire ride, which was about 20 minutes. We were out on the interstate. We came back, and we rode on the Texas Motor Speedway for a little bit and, and uh, really didn't get to the vehicle until the end of the ride because we just were comfortable being in there. So it is, I think, an adaption curve that people have to get used to. So Definitely. Yeah. So, Dave, sure. what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are when – when people drive with me, they can't take a nap. They're just, <laughs> so I think they would rather drive in an autonomous vehicle because they know they're probably safer. Well, the white knuckle thing comes to mind when you're driving. So, yeah. <laughs> For your passengers, that is. Yeah, they yeah. just don't realize that. They don't worry. I'm in control. <clears throat> and that's what they're worried about because I am in control. So was there anything else in Toronto that really stuck out to you, Dave? 
Well, I mentioned that we there's this new app that they are working on. It's called RideCo, and it's kind of unique. It's uh, where communities um, get together and individuals, and they do some cost share riding. So you can you can book in advance and you can share rides. So you're using your vehicle, but you might have four or five people in your neighborhood, you know, that go to the same location, and uh, you know you take turns, and it's nothing different than. You know what I see in the in the uh, field work here in in uh, North Dakota, where people will live in Bismarck and work in Beulah, and they'll get a vehicle and four will take turns right. driving back and forth. But you're seeing that happen maybe more in, in the urban settings now too. So it's kind of a uh, a neat concept. Um, and uh, I know in Toronto now they're just they've got I think two or three different areas marked within the city that you have this uh, ride share concept. So moving forward, and I'm going to throw this back to you now, Katie, you know, an app like, what's it called again, Dave? Ride? Rideco. Rideco. Okay. So it's a, it's a ride share app. Do you, do you see, Katie, move into the future that maybe a group of people would purchase a, an autonomous vehicle and then use an app like Rideshare so that they could uh, program that autonomous vehicle to come and pick them up or go get their kids or, or whatever? Absolutely. I think that there's just so many taxes and insurance and things, you know, happening now with everything. I mean, just in living in general, uh, after Hurricane Sandy here, now they, uh, here on Long Island, there's something called like a water tax that if you live within a mile of the water, and you have to pay an extra tax on top of uh, extra insurance now, on top of everything else. So things like that add up. And I do believe that, you know, people are going to be able to cut down on a lot, uh, a lot of things, uh, your insurance, your car payments, everything by ride sharing. So I do believe it is the future. I think there could be really nice, clean cars that you could, um, you know, set up to, to share with certain people. I could definitely see that being uh, a big thing in the future. Was this talked about, Dave? Uh, a little bit. One thing that, that I've always thought about, too, and just mentioned it briefly up at the, the show, is that if you've got four families and they buy one car together and uh, everybody takes turns in, in utilizing that, um, cuts down on, on the cost, too. So that, that's something to consider. Well, there's no doubt. I mean, I look at even the couple cars that we have. Um, they sit idle most of the time. I mean, they're in the garage or whatever. So there's, there's if there was a, a, an, you know, an easy way that a person could share that vehicle out and, and be compensated properly for it or however you want to do that, uh, I, I and I, I certainly do see that. I also see, you know, fleets like Uber, Lyft, those type of companies buying those type of vehicles so that they can actually, you know, have autonomous vehicles. So they'll deploy autonomous vehicles to pick up people and give them rides. So I think more people would go, will start going that route as well. So especially in urban areas where you don't have a vehicle now, it just gives you one more choice to start moving around. Well, it's interesting. I, I had a friend of mine I mentioned that's uh, designing this new runabout, uh, one one or two passenger vehicle. But the statistics show right now that 95 percent of daily commutes are less than twenty miles, with seventy percent of those trips less than five miles. So if you look at it, you know, and eighty six, I'm sorry, seventy eight percent of those are undertaken with just one occupant in the vehicle. Sure. So there's a, there's a lot of wasted, uh, you know, people, like I said, f- uh, vehicles that aren't being used uh, to their full capacity as well. Yep, yep. So, Katie, go ahead and weigh in again. Well, I, I do. I, I think there's going to be a lot of different ways that people are going to interact with this these type of changes in the future. I do think that people will still own cars. I don't think people will just completely give up having their own car. But I think there will be more options, and some of those options might be uh, in the form of people going in together to have a car together, or also, like you said before, Marla, to have your own uh, lift. These car companies will be sending their cars to you, and you're just reserving their autonomous car to bring you to wherever you have to go. But uh, it is going to have a big impact. But for now, you know, that is still some time away. I mean, we have so many things going on with autonomous cars now we're just in the beginning of all this technology, and, and especially for uh, 
consumers to start owning their own autonomous cars. It's just starting to come out now, so it's really exciting. So one of the things that come up a lot, and I know Dave has been at the forefront of this, is insurance. And you have some some friends that have actually written some white papers on how autonomous vehicles will actually reduce the cost of insurance moving forward, uh, simply because there will be less collisions, you know, less fatalities, all this stuff kind of wraps into that. This is interesting right. to me. Um, so th- there is somebody that's actually studying this right now, that if they put the liability of the producer of the vehicle that's the re- that is I'm trying to word this in a proper way, that takes responsibility for the accident. So let's say there's an accident, and the producer of the vehicle that caused the accident takes 100% liability for that. You will actually, pr- when you purchase your car, your car will come with insurance built into it. So whatever you pay for your car, there will be no more additional payments because the producer of the vehicle takes 100% liability to it. So, um, And we're, we're getting up on break here again, so we'll discuss that a little bit. I might not have worded that the way I wanted to, I guess, but uh, uh, we'll get into that about the liability of insurance as well as... How do cars make those decisions when they're going down the road? And there's some new AI that's coming out that will help us with that as well. So come on back, everybody. Right now, 37. You're Sean Hannity. Weekday afternoons on Super Talk 1270. Follow the guru of geek everywhere he goes. Post your comments or questions at thetechranch.com. Once again, your guru of geek, Marlo Anderson. And today is all about autonomous vehicles, everybody. Mr. Jim Walsh is in studio along with Dave Blair from KLJ. We also have Miss Metaverse Katie Aquino joining us from Long Island over in the New York area. And welcome again, everybody. We are uh, we were just talking about the insurance side of things, and I didn't probably state this very well. So, again, 100% of the liability... Uh, could be put on the producer of the vehicle. And then when you purchase your vehicle, you're actually purchasing the insurance with it. So there would be no more insurance on a monthly or an annual basis that you'd be paying for that. What are your thoughts on that, Katie? I think it's great. I, I think that we're going to see, just like when you go into uh, go into a vacation, you know, you, you get the built-in travel insurance. We'll have the same built into the apps or whatever we're using, like uh, Uber or Lyft very possible just be built into the services that we're going to be using so i am all for it i think that the more simple things can be the better it will be for all of us okay so i and i I think i will agree with that as well so uh dave now we have a comment on meerkat and for those of you who are not familiar with meerkat it's an online streaming uh service you can go to meerkat.com and watch this or you can just go to the tech ranch and watch what's going on in the studio here so Firefighter 13 on Meerkat uh, states that autonomous vehicles will not be accepted easily, and his reason for that is fear of computer failure. So in Toronto, Dave, uh, when you were just there last week at the summit, was this brought up at all? Um, Not really, but I think that, you know, it's something that definitely has to be addressed out there, that, uh, you know, we're going to see some of that disruption and that the, actually the conference was called a uh, autonomous vehicle the next disruptive technology okay okay so you know they were looking at it from both the pros and the cons of some of that so do you feel that because uh and i'm, I'm going back to fire firefighter 13 on uh meerkat here you know, stating the fear of computer failure, is is this because when you and I work on computers right now that they tend to fail a lot? I mean, we get the blue screen of death and all this other stuff that goes on. Do you think people, because they have those issues and viruses and everything else, that they think this is going to move over to the autonomous car? Oh, it, it very well, it, and I'm sure there's concerns on there. I, I think like we had talked about too, maybe there needs to be an override system to that takes place too but you know if all these new cars are are so um computerized already that there's so many different safeguards already built into them so do you uh katie i'm going to throw this back to you now so we have a lot of ways that we move people now whether it's airplanes or or trucks or or i shouldn't say trucks but trams you know in airports and and all kinds of things i i don't 
think I've I can recall an airplane coming down because of a computer failure, but I might be wrong about that. How about have you ever heard of anything like that? No, I haven't. And and that's funny because that's probably one of my greatest examples to give people to comfort them when it comes to the future of autonomous cars because a lot of people do compare, you know, technology failing just because our computers at home end up failing. But we have to take into consideration that we don't maintain our computers the way they should be ma- maintained. Uh, we can rely on um, our airplanes not crashing and these things happening because they are so well kept. You know, there's a system, there's a way of making sure that everything's functioning properly and, and whatnot. So I, I think that, you know, there will be ways to rely on our technology, uh, especially in autonomous cars, I would compare it more towards being as safe as flying on an airplane uh, in comparison to your blue screen of death on your PC. Well, I think sure. one, of, one of the things with a PC or a tablet or whatever is that usually when it comes out of the factory, they work pretty good. You know, they're tested, they're all, they, they have all this stuff. Then Dave gets his computer and he throws on Photoshop and he throws on this and he throws on that and he throws on the software that probably when when Apple or Microsoft even brought this stuff out, didn't even know this stuff was coming out at the time. And, and we forced these computers. Dave's computer, even if he bought the exact same model uh, of, the, of what I have at the exact same time, would be totally different today as far as software and everything goes than what I have. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we have so many issues with PCs is because they're designed pretty good when they come out of the, out of the factory and then as we add our stuff to it, you have that issue. That is not the case with systems that have one purpose. And that one purpose is to fly an airplane, to drive a, drive a uh, tram, or to drive a car. I mean, these things are kind of locked up. You know, only the companies that will be putting software on there or add the software will be putting software on there. So there won't be at least a lot of, anyway, third-party type of software is being added. So I think that's why you see that. So Firefighter 13, I was making the comment, to airplanes go with all pilots? Actually, sometimes they do. You just don't. I mean, there's always somebody there as a safeguard. And I think in autonomous cars, that'll be the way, too. I mean, there's there's almost no talk of an, uh, of an autonomous vehicle driving by itself right now. Is there, Dave? No, there's not. But, you know, back to that comment, which is interesting, is that, okay, if if a fire truck is an autonomous vehicle and they're going to a fire, I mean, that, that fire truck, um, if it's it's all programmed in, it's going to get there in the fastest, shortest route. It's going to know exactly what right. streets it should go on to avoid traffic, even though I know that there's signals out there that you have to stop and pull over and everything like that. But man, in major cities, I mean, it's impossible. Yes, it's almost impossible. You don't know. You have no way to get out of the way. Exactly. So, so that I think that's uh, something that definitely needs to be uh, looked at and, and addressed. But that's where testing comes in. You yep. know, that's what we've been talking about here. Yep. Yep. And I guess the the one thing is for sure. I mean, all that we talk about. If you don't like the technology, you don't have to use it. There's nobody forcing anybody to use a smartphone or a cell phone. It makes your life might make your life a little bit easier, but if you still want a landline, you can still do that. So, you know, I I was just going to jump back to the insurance side of things because it just I just thought about if if autonomous vehicle runs into a non-autonomous vehicle. Right. Okay, and then who's at fault? Well, with the autonomous vehicle, I mean, either you have cameras, you got all the data right there. You can go back and check and go, on, hey, you know, this this vehicle stopped, this one didn't, it cut me off. You know, there's going to be cameras that are going to show all that right, stuff as right, well. Exactly. So uh, you know, th- those days and are are coming. There's no question about yeah, it. Yeah, they'll always be able to. You'll have some data to make an assessment as to who's at fault. <laughs> And then Always. who owns that data? <laughs> that's that's true. That's probably going to have to be a whole other yep. show. Yep. Katie, what? Are, any final thoughts on your side? Um, well, final thoughts would be uh, I start collaborating on a new website. It's called Cars Fera, and they're going to be writing all about autonomous cars and stuff. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Oh, that's cool. What's... I know we talk about autonomous cars in the future a lot, 
Um, so it's going to be pretty cool. It's all about cars and technology. Give me that uh, link, and I'll put that up on the website. I definitely will. Thank you, Katie. Any any final thoughts, Dave? Uh, we got to talk about the corridor. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> throw, throw that out real quick. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we've we been working on this uh, autonomous-friendly corridor um, over a cup of coffee. Me, uh, a couple of years ago, me and Marlo got uh, – got started, sidetracked on doing something unique. And uh, that was part of the reason I was up in Toronto. And uh, everybody's very intrigued with what we're trying to do, uh, moving freight um, from Canada down to Mexico or Mexico up to Canada. And um, at some time, maybe that would be another discussion we can have about, you know, how that legislation would go, what regulations come with that, cross-border crossings into Canada versus the United States. So, uh, Definitely a lot of positive um, feedback on that. Great. And, and again, more information can be found at cnatca.com as well. So, yeah, that's uh, it's interesting. And, and I, I love uh, – I actually love this story because it was it, – this whole thing started over a cup of coffee. And uh, we have a lot of traction with this particular scenario now, the Autonomous Friendly Corridor, which will be running right through the middle of North Dakota, hopefully alleviating some of our – our uh, bottlenecks when it comes to moving goods out of out of this area. So uh, cool as well. And tomorrow, by the way, um, I will be on KFGL over in the Fargo area. Yay! So if you want to <laughs> join me over there, I'll be on the Jack and Amy show. So for those of you who are going to be in the Fargo area or I think um, Western Minnesota, they probably cover and they probably cover all kinds of. Yeah, they have a transmitter. A large transmitter, I should say, over that way. So anyway, looking forward to that as well. And uh, I think that's all we have for the day. Katie, thank you. Thank you, Marla. Thanks, Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Dave. Everybody have a great week.